I'm Clara Fay Hart Rutledge, and I am the oldest of the um, Paul and Clara Taylor who own this farm. I'm the oldest of the grandchildren, and um, we're right here, what used to be uh, Route 6. This is my brother, I'll let you tell him. I'll let him tell you who he is. You forgot already? I forgot who My was. name's Art of Ed Taylor. I probably have to take it out. I have the middle name of Taylor, which is my grandfather who owned the farm's name. I uh, guess since he's bringing out who's the oldest, I'm the second in line as far as age is concerned. When I look back now, it was really like being in a fairy tale. My earliest memory, because it was here, uh, actually where we were actually brought up is less than two miles from here but we were so family oriented. So my memories really start right here uh, with my grandmother. Uh, <laughs> there are pictures of uh, me where I would be in the grape arbor. There used to be a beautiful grape arbor there. Uh, there were flower beds and uh, as a matter of fact, there's a baby picture of me right over on the side of the house where I was busy picking flowers. And so she would be working uh, around watching me, but she made me toys. I had bonnets. Uh, I guess every southern girl is supposed to wear a bonnet, but my grandmother was always with a bonnet on herself, the work bonnets, and uh, you know, I, I, I played. Uh, I can remember uh, just running up and down in the hills and uh, singing. It was just wonderful. It was just always happy. I mean, I, I don't ever remember uh, there never being any kind of unhappiness, you know, here. It was my own little um, fairy tale when I tell people about it. Uh, in reality, I guess they would look at you and say, oh, you're making all that up. But it was wonderful. And they're just happy memories. No, uh, it was, a, it was a, um, a place of security. Uh, it was almost like you went out into the other world, but here, everything was fine. I mean, and, and sometimes I laugh when I look at those old westerns. It wasn't quite that primitive, but a lot of the things, seriously, that you see on Little House on the Prairie, just the way it was here for us. Really was. Being on a farm, of course, naturally, first thing you're going to introduce to is animals. From kittens, dogs, all the way up to the mule that Pop Pop had, uh, cattle, big time cattle. Uh, delivered my first calf when I was just probably nine years old. Uh, things of that nature. It gave us a very good outlook on life as far as also not only the love involved, but how to treat animals. That carries over into how to treat people. I did not know that there's anything outside of Pop Pop and Granny. Uh, this was heaven. And that's how I took it. I mean, you could do no wrong. You got corrected if you did, but it, even when that happened, it was like you did no wrong. It's just a great life. I, if I could repeat anything over, that's what I'd want to repeat. I didn't know I was black. I didn't know I was pink. I didn't know I was from Jupiter. I didn't know any of that because all of the neighbors were white and no one ever brought any of that up. I found out I was black when I started first grade and I was in an integrated, uh, segregated school. And at that time, that's when I found this out. You had all of that. And so you just thought life was like that until, you know, you found out that the world, you know, wasn't, you know, the way that we were taught here. It was, that was quite a shock for me. Quite a shock for me when I found out that the world was not the way that uh, we had been uh, taught here. But, you know, my grandfather and my parents, they taught us people are people. We all bleed red. Now, we were also taught about our heritage, though. And I probably have a stronger sense of that because of having gone, you know, through segregation and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But that was, like I said early on, it was almost just like a, almost, I laugh and say when I talk about it, even to, uh, some of the kids, it's like I'm making up something, you know, and it, that was my realism. And my sister and I have often talked that maybe we were too protected, you know, from the real world. Sometimes that can happen too. But everything was safe when you were here. But as I said, I still remember distinctly June the 20th, 1967. That's when he died. And nothing, I'm 67 now, but nothing has ever been the same. There have also been people through the years that have told me, and I couldn't understand sometimes when they would be doing things for me, and they would say, I'm doing that because of what your grandfather did for
for us when we were growing up because I found out there was one family that when the father had passed away, my grandfather immediately, all, it wasn't just that immediate time when they bring food in, he continued because she had a house full of small children. And he was a firm believer that to those much is given, much is expected. And I did not know for years and years because I, I, the, she was an older woman and sometimes she would watch my children and I would say, well, how much do I owe you? And she said, nothing. And she would never take anything. And then later her son told me, he said, your grandfather kept us from starving. And so he always did things and did not want people to know. He said, if you have to tell people you're doing it, then why are you doing it? And of course he was a deacon, so that was a part you know, of that. Washington County was primarily an agricultural county. At one time in Washington County, there were over 250 family-owned dairy farms. To date, there are now four. Big change, big change. Part of that I attributed to what we call corporate farming. The family farm was more or less rooted out because you cannot compete when you have the money that corporations have and they can combine their revenues and their resources and just basically push you out so you can't compete with them. Uh, even this very farm right here, people ask about the farm and I tell them it's a hobby. My brother, he, he's the big player here. He runs the cattle. I have a horse next door with two other horses that uh, keep my horse busy. Uh, but outside of that, as far as trying to make a living now as when Pop-Pop and Granny in their days, that was a very lucrative living. You could really stand out and do well. Today, it's not like that. So just the economics involved in it, I think, is the, the biggest thing. But I attribute it to corporate farming and, and of course, the direction that society as a whole is going into. Uh, part of it, as kids were growing up and learning new things outside of the farm, they wanted to leave the farm. They did not want to come back and support the farm. So that was a combination of the other things that I just listed. I think that's pretty much put the last nail in the coffin for the family farmer, especially in this part of the country. And that's one of the reasons why this is so dear to us because the one thing that we promised in a roundabout way was that this would never become a subdivision. Exactly. Because right now when I look up and see houses there and I see all this, because all of that that you're looking at over there, that's not ours, but I, that was a dairy farm over there, that was the young farm. And now when I look and uh, see all these subdivisions, it's like, and that was the promise, because even my brother said that. He said, you know, I pop off work too hard, just what I was uh, saying earlier. He said, for this to become a subdivision. And so as long as he lives, as long as we live, this will remain here. And I don't know the, uh, I would, I don't know if it'll end up being a model farm, maybe for one of the universities. I don't know, I mean, at this point, but it will never in our lifetime become, uh, you know, just land as such. This is our heritage. And uh, for me, I'd love to have a little cabin. I'd be just fine, you know, putting it over here. But he has cattle, and that's what they do. And, you know, that's okay. It's okay. One of the things that we talk about is it's really just so sad that so many are not connecting with their heritage because I'm who I am because of this. And I'm standing on the shoulders of my parents, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents, and my great-great because on the Taylors, I'm back to 1800, I can't tell you beyond, but hopefully I'll find out. So, and all of them were landowners. It was like, again, take care of the land. Uh, for them, early on, it might have just been one or two acres. And so that's what I stop and think of now is, if they could look and see now, with all four of us, I'm very fortunate, all four of us have our college degrees. Some of us have advanced degrees, but all four children. And that's something, I mean, when you stop and think about that, that's such a legacy right there, I think. And it's because education, citizenship, serving God, doing for others. And that's what has made us who we are. We are not in history books like we should be. Perfect example. And I battled with uh, the uh, history department because I'm an English teacher. And it's like, they kind of like, well, you know, you need to stay in your lane and stay out of ours. Eli Whitney did not invent the cotton gin. Eli Whitney had a slave who invented the cotton gin. 
and any self-respecting person that would be in that situation, I would want to make things as simple as possible. But you, when you open this up, and one of the things that I see are, you know, Granville Woods, you talk about just so many people that would go back that I think when people now want to talk about, uh, well, that was then. Well, my opinion is that was then, but could we just tell the facts? I said, I've got to go do uh, this interview, but I didn't really say beyond that, and one of, only one other person knew about it. And she said, are you going down to the farm? And I said, yes, and I let it go at that. So this other person, and it was kind of, in a way, it, it threw me, but then I thought, no, she's young. And so she said, Mrs. Rutledge, you had a farm? I said, I was brought up on a farm. I'm going to my grandfather's farm. And then she kind of looked for a few minutes. Now, this is a 40-year-old woman, and she, she also teaches, by the way. And she said, so your family were sharecroppers? No, we weren't sharecroppers. And I looked at her, and for a minute, you know, there was a little part right there. She's like, oh, what's wrong with you? And then I happened to think. So you see what I'm saying? There's just that general concept. And she meant no harm, you know, when she said that. And I, and, but, I mean, there's this, and I think that that has a lot to do with when people, because of the situation with sharecropping and when they made those migrations and they went into industry uh, thinking they were going to get better jobs and what have you so I think that there's this concept that there were not black farmers and of course I tell people that in the Midwest you know you have black farmers uh, my brother uh, has, goes out there quite frequent, frequently because of what he does you know at the University of Tennessee I mean it's agriculture so they're out there but I don't think that we have um, our faces are not there. It's almost like you're some kind of novelty or something. And I stop and think, well, everybody has to eat food. Everybody has to eat food. So I think that that's one of the things that, um, I think my brother said that a few minutes ago, a lot of people just did not really want to get their hands dirty.